I watched some of the early stuff, but well, actually, I should say the end of the day here was the beginning of the day in California, so I watched some of it there. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I ask you to take your seats so we could start our closing plenary session? So this is the last session of the Terrain Networking Conference 2011. And it is my pleasure and privilege to announce our last keynote speaker at this conference, John Wilbanks, who is running the science project at the Creative Commons. And without a large and long introductions, I'd like to say that John is going to say, uh, say a few words about the open access and its relation to our community and the work we do. John, please. So thank you, Miro. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for, for being here. I uh, wanted to start with uh, a couple of thanks of my own. I've not made this easy on uh, Tarina to be here. So in addition to thanking the, the organization, I'd like to specifically thank Anna and Yungi uh, for some difficulties I caused in getting myself here. And the only reason I can apologize for that is that I have a, a nine-week-old son at home. And uh, as a result, it was very hard for me to get away. So I came in yesterday, and I'll be running out of here as soon as I'm done uh, to go home and change his diapers. But Anna and Yungi were really very uh, flexible and wonderful in, in helping to make sure that I could be here today to be a part of this. And I, I read along, I've been following the Twitter stream and, and I've been following some of the live presentations and I noted in the uh, opening panel there was a conversation about Kepler and Brahe meeting in Prague 400 years ago as sort of the beginning of big science collaborations. And it struck a memory in my head about how astronomy in the early days 
um, is a great example of where some of these issues that, that I'm going to talk about came from. So this is Copernicus. It's a statue of him in, in Poland. And when Copernicus discovered or demonstrated that the Earth actually revolved around the sun and not the other way around, he got this wonderful letter um, from a high up in the Catholic Church. And I would encourage you to focus on the bottom of it where it says, therefore, with the utmost earnestness I entreat you, and some, some polite discourse follows, to send me your writings on the sphere of the universe together with the tables and whatever else you have that is relevant to the subject. And I think this is the first time in history of a demand for peer review of something that came out. And what's fascinating is that if you don't communicate research, it can't be powerful. If you learn something and you keep it to yourself, then you might as well, in many ways, not have done the research at all. And so when I, when I think about astronomy, when I think about what happened here 400 years ago, I also think about what happened pretty soon after that, which was this desire to have the communication, not just of the writings, but of the tables, um, of the data that were required to understand um, that we actually lived in a universe where the Earth revolved around the sun and not the other way around. So the, the first thing I want to, to get out into your uh, minds here is the idea that the law has an unexpected power to many people in the technology world to defeat unexpected uses of technology. And I'm using this word unexpected on, on purpose because I think one of the highest values of networks, as we know them technically, is their capacity to generate uses that were not designed or foreseen by the people that made the networks in the first place. So uh, anyone out there recognize this drawing? Okay, one or two people. It is the first node on the internet in 1969. It's uh, the internet message processor at UCLA with the first host, which was a Sigma 7 computer at UCLA. And all, uh, all of these computer history graphs are coming off of this link up here. So you'll, if you want to go see them, it's a wonderful place. And so there was nothing in the architecture that connected the internet message processor to the, to the first computer uh, from building other things. Right? The initial goal of the ARPANET was simply to let computers pass information to each other. There was a bureaucrat in Washington. He had three different computers in his office. And it really angered him that those three computers couldn't talk to each other. And that demand is really what drove the, the, the emergence of the internet in the first place. And so you fairly quickly from 1967, you get to 1969, where you've got four computers on the ARPANET. You've got Utah, you've got SRI, UCSB, and UCLA. It's still West Coast US-centric. Three of them are in California. But again, nothing in the architecture to prevent the network from growing. So in 1971, you see suddenly there's a cluster of nodes erupting on the east coast of the United States. And between 1971 and 1980, there was an absolute eruption. And what you see is the beginning of satellite links over to London, um, to Hawaii, and to other places. Because computers started getting smaller, faster, and cheaper. Uh, when the internet was first designed, computers were the size of a room. You had to schedule time on them. Uh, and you pretty much had to be at a university that had the money to get one. But between 1971 and 1980, uh, the sorts of computers that could connect to the internet uh, became much cheaper and much faster. And along the way, the Apple I, which is the first real personal computer, was invented. Now, and it's a long way when you think uh, Steve Jobs probably doesn't like see, having this, this picture shown. Uh, but they built this in their garage, right, Jobs and Wozniak. And there was nothing in the architecture of the internet that prevented that early computer from being connected to the internet. And it's a little cut off here. But by 1987, the internet had absolutely exploded. And personal computers were now connecting to it because they weren't prevented from doing so. And it would have been very easy for the original designers of the network to make choices that only allowed authorized computers to connect to the internet, that only allowed large computers at large institutions to connect to the internet. But there was an explicit choice made not to forestall unexpected technical developments. And so it didn't just allow for the growth of the network. It allowed for the emergence of things like email, which was never, ever even dreamed of in the earliest request for comments and request for proposals for the internet processors. And that allowed the next major unexpected development, which was the release of the World Wide Web. 
And again, this was an unexpected development. There were people who were thinking about hypertext in the late 1960s, Ted Nelson and the Xanadu Project in particular, uh, but I don't think anyone expected uh, a piece of software written at the CERN physics lab to help people connect lots of different protocols about physics data together to explode and become this thing that's on all of our phones and on all of our cultures today. So this emergence of hypertext and browsers as a consumer product was a completely unexpected development. But there was nothing in the architecture that prevented it. They, in many ways, chose weaker connection protocols and weaker connection standards that allowed for these unexpected developments to come out. And Tim Berners-Lee has actually written down this rule as what he calls the rule of least power. And it's a bit of a paradox, but when you're designing standards, frequently the least powerful standard that achieves the goals is the best one. Because the more powerful the language you use, the more powerful the tool that you use, the more likely you are to inhibit unexpected information reuse. And so I'd, it's, a, it's actually a formal rule of the web consortium called the rule of least power, which I would encourage you to check out. It's a, it's a nice piece of technical writing. And the web itself led to uh, another unexpected development, which is the absolute disruption of content industries. And so I'm showing you um, and a representation of what's happened to the music industry, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but it wasn't just the music industry. It was all content industries where the content could be dig digitized um, have undergone significant disruption because of this technological process. Um, and the thing is that when you get into the content business, there actually is something in the architecture to prevent people from sharing. It's not in the technical architecture necessarily, although it can be included. It's in the legal architecture. Of the, of the world that we live in, and it's called copyright. And copyright was not intended to prevent research and education from happening. It was intended to provide an incentive to a creator to create more things. But the way that it works now uh, is not something that's optimized for the people in this room. It's optimized for this guy. Uh, copyright lasts a really, really, really long time in any perspective. The copyright on this talk will expire 75 years after I die. Now, that doesn't create a lot of incentives for me to create during the years after my death. But it does prevent Mickey Mouse from falling into the public domain, where he would become the subject of commercial exploitation by people that are not the Disney Corporation. And so copyright law has become something that really benefits large media corporations. Right? For better or for worse, that's a different argument than the one that I want to make here. But copyright law now makes research and education on the network very difficult. It's now a fundamental piece of the architecture that the technical network has bumped up against to. And I'll use a personal example from my own family to talk about why I don't think this is a very good thing. So this is my sister. Um, she has a very rare form of arthritis. It's uh, psoriatic and rheumatoid. She's had it since she was about four years old. Um, my other sister is autistic, so we don't have a lot of health in our family, unfortunately. But if she wanted to read the medical research that her tax dollars had paid for, she would go to PubMed, which is a U.S. government service that lets you search through medical abstracts. We would look for things like treatments for psoriatic arthritis and their side effects. Uh, and you would get abstracts that look an awful lot like this. Now, this is a, for a drug called Embril in combination with a drug called Methotrexate. She has at different points been on each of these. Uh, and each of them have nasty side effects that have been studied extensively in taxpayer-funded, university-driven studies of the sort that your users operate. Um, if she wants to actually read the article, however, the, this is what happens. So you can get the full text article if you are a healthcare practitioner interested in a pay-per-view purchase of the article. Uh, it's pay-per-view. It's like watching a movie on pay-per-view. It self-destructs after 24 hours. Um, or if you happen to be at a wealthy university that has a subscription to the journal that she was looking at. Um, there are 547 answers, or there were when I put this together last week, uh, that found you these two drugs and arthritis. So at a, an average price of $20 per article, she's looking at about 11000 U.S. to read the literature about her disease and the likely side effects she would get from taking the drugs that are most likely to be prescribed to her. And this isn't just a cost to her, it's a cost to her doctors, who ideally ought to know everything that should be known about the disease before they begin treating it. So this is why I do what I do, is that it strikes me that the highest value of the network we've got 
can only be realized if we begin to find ways to harmonize the technical architecture of the network, which facilitates unexpected reuse, with the legal architectures of the world we live in, which do not facilitate unexpected reuse unless there's an intervention made. And so I spend my life intervening and trying to find ways that we can use the law in unexpected ways to enable unexpected uses of technology. And the reality is that's very difficult to do um, by trying to change the law. The easiest way to do this is to find ways to use the law as it exists today um, to begin enabling these sorts of innovations right away. So that was my first point, that the law has this unexpected impact to, to, to regulate unexpected uses of technology, and we should actually celebrate and design for unexpected uses of technology. And I'm going to come back to that. But the, I wanted to make a second point before I, I, come, I come back to it, which is that the network has this other unexpected impact on content, which is that it fragments content that used to be integrated by its medium. And what I mean here is that we used to think about music, for example. Um, I'm old enough to remember vinyl albums. I assume many people here are as well. Uh, but we used to think of music, the natural unit of music was the album, or maybe the double album, right, especially in the 70s with some, some live music. Um, but you would purchase and consume this stuff right, in units, which were albums. And you'd go to stores, and you would touch them, and you would look at them. And even if you only liked one song, you had to buy the album. And so as the physical medium of vinyl, later of magnetic tape, and then eventually of, of CDs, that actually integrated the content. And it wasn't naturally the way that we wanted to consume or the optimi optimal version of how to consume that. It was the medium that drove that. But the network has totally broken that apart by allowing us to consume music not based on its physical medium, but on a much more natural unit, right? So the natural atomic music unit is not the album or the CD. It's the song. And the network has revealed that because it's broken us apart from the medium. So this is just a little bit of data on where the, U the United States recorded music revenues are coming from. So the, the sort of um, purple line that's now way at the top is downloads of singles. The one that is dropping really sharply is, uh, is, is mobile content. No one expected that to, to drop as fast as it is. Um, but album downloads are going a lot slower than single downloads. And the other funny thing is that despite the protestations of the music industry, all the lines except mobile are going up. So even though we've fragmented the content away from the medium, the sales are actually going up. So there's an opportunity here in the fragmentation of the medium, um, not something we should be fighting, it's something we should be exploiting. And if you look at the sales of singles as the atomic unit of music per person, it's exploded now that we've gone digital. So the music industry is unfortunately obsessed with pursuing cases against people who are sort of naturally moving to this idea of the single or the song as the unit of music. Um, even as we can demonstrate through data that, that by fragmenting away from the medium, there's actually a real business opportunity. Uh, and unfortunately, you're going to see this pattern replicated again and again and again in content industries. It's happening to movies. So movies are being cut up and rema remixed and mashed around on YouTube. This is a great example of an African kid whose favorite movie is Commando, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He has the entire movie memorized. And it's an intercut of him describing the movies uh, with scenes from the movie. And you can, you can catch it from the, the shortened link that's up there. So the natural medium of a movie may be to watch it in full length in a dark theater that looks an awful lot like this room. But in terms of a creative reuse or an unexpected reuse of this to illustrate that not all life in Africa is miserable, that in fact many people there have joy and happiness in their lives, this is an unexpected reuse of the content that the copyright law doesn't allow and that the film industry is actively discouraging. These are the sorts of things that get taken down off of YouTube because they violate copyright. It's happening in news. The newspaper industry in the United States is in dire straits because you can aggregate. Right? This is from this morning uh, on Google News sometime around 5 a.m. Prague time. And the good news is if you drink at least six cups of coffee a day and you're male, it appears that your prostate cancer risk is lower. Um, and that is relevant to me for reasons I'll talk about in a bit, both because of my coffee and my genetic prostate cancer profile. 
So this is another content industry that's being ripped apart. And there are lawsuits going on, and there's much hand-wringing in the United States over the death of the news industry, because again, I shouldn't have to buy a physical copy of the newspaper to get access to the story on coffee and prostate cancer. And in fact, I should be able to read 15 stories on coffee and prostate cancer without having to read about ovarian cancer, because I'm not interested in ovarian cancer. But a woman looking at this page might have a very different view. And so by disaggregating from the medium, we get this incredible power, but there's this resistance that comes from the law that's not in the architecture of the internet, it's in the architecture of the society. But all of these changes are happening because of a series of choices made in the late 1960s in the design of a simple, open, standard, common network. Right? None of these would have been possible if we'd had 25 internets. None of these would be possible if we'd had 25 webs. It is because we adopted simple, open monopolies, if you will, that we got this. And the internet is a monopoly. It's an open monopoly. It's a non-discriminatory monopoly. Um, but it is indeed a monopoly in the fact that if you don't use TCP IP, uh, no one's going to know you're there. The web is an open monopoly in the way that if you don't use HTML, people won't read your web pages, despite the efforts of multiple companies to try to fork it. And so this is the power of these open but standard and common network designs. And while the content industries have been transformed, there are multiple industries that haven't been transformed. So science has been less transformed than the newspaper industry. Education, government, research generally, not just science, uh, and medicine have all significantly resisted these sorts of mass transformations. And so we spend a lot of our time at Creative Commons in the science project trying to figure out why. What's the resistance? And um, what we have discovered is, and, I, and I, I didn't want to complicate things, so I'm not actually going to play the YouTube clip, but if you've ever seen The Matrix, there's a scene where uh, the agent holds Neo's head and he says, you know, do you hear that? That is the sound of inevitability. And it's an oncoming train. And that is the sound that the journal publishers are hearing. That is the sound that the research industry is hearing. It is the sound that the educational industry is hearing. And it is the sound that the medical industry is hearing. And what it is the sound of is openness. And the impact of individuals, governments, funders, institutions requiring that what they pay for be made available back to them after they pay for it. And so these industries that have resisted change because they're part of institutional complexes um, are going to be forced open whether they like it or not. And the only question is whether or not we're going to do that using a simple, open, common network approach or something else. And I'm, my fear is that it will be something else because it's often more tempting to engineer powerful, complete solutions than to adopt simple, open, weak but extensible ones. Now, resisting the resistance, right, in education and medicine and research is, is, is something that I would call, it's actually an emergent property of people that are networked. Um, the music industry calls this piracy. I, I call it resisting the resistance. And it comes from uh, a guy named Eben Moglen, who for a long time was the lawyer at the Free Software Foundation. And his theory was that if you wrapped the world in internet and spun it, that free software would come down the wires because people actually like to share with each other, a certain number of them. And so the reason that the sound of inevitability is what these industries hear is because networked people like to share stuff with each other. We like to forward emails to each other. We like to forward interesting articles to each other. We like to share links. We like to, we like, to like things on Facebook. We like to tweet things. Right? And we don't have to ask, what's my incentive? Right, the question is, what's the resistance to my doing so electrically? What's the resistance in the wire to me sharing something? And copyright is part of that resistance. Culture is part of that resistance. But trying to fight back against that resistance and share stuff anyway is actually something that people just do. And all of the attempts to figure out why have been stymied because it just turns out people like sharing stuff. Now... One of the first examples of the government industrial complex being transformed is the creation of sites all across the world like data.gov. This is the US version. 
Um, they have them in the UK, they have them in Australia, they have them in New Zealand, they have them across the European community. And it's this growing understanding that making public data from the government available to the public is actually a really good idea. It's not something to be afraid of. And it's good in the sense that it lets sociologists do interesting work using census data. It also lets people do very um, useful things like figuring out when the bus is going to come, which you can do if you make GPS data that's on real-time bus controllers available so that I can have a smartphone app that says, you know what, it's really cold. The bus isn't going to be here for four and a half minutes. I'm not going to go outside yet. The education industrial complex is about to be transformed. Um, this is an example of a company called Flat World Knowledge. They are a publishing company that gives away their books for free because they recognize that in a digital world, selling printed copies of textbooks is actually a pretty crappy business model. If they had sold you a bunch of textbooks about North Africa history and you bought them in December and had them shipped in early January, they would not have any of the revolutions. They would have nothing about the death of Osama bin Laden. And you would be stuck with them and you wouldn't have the right to change them. If, however, you had purchased the copyrights to those books in a digital version, you could update them, you could even have the crowd update them from Wikipedia if you wanted, and you could reprint them at $80 a pop. And that's if you wanted a high quality reprint. If you wanted to use lesser quality paper and binding, you could do it as low as $20 a book. So this company just raised $17 million in venture capital in the United States. The Obama administration is putting $2 billion into open educational materials, which will all be under the most liberal Creative Commons license, attribution only. So the education industrial complex is on its way to being transformed as well. Right? This is the sound of inevitability. The science publishing complex is under transformation as well. This is the Public Library of Science. It's a nonprofit publisher uh, founded uh, just under 10 years ago in the United States. Um, the idea was to demonstrate that by giving away articles, right, by charging the cost of publications at the time that an article is submitted to the publisher, rather than forcing people to pay those subscriptions like my sister had to pay, that that was actually better for science. It wasn't just better for my sister, it was better for science. Because then those articles could be text mined, they could be hyperlinked, they could be indexed by Google, they could be reprocessed by companies, they could be shared in systems like iTunes. So PLOS uh, was, was sort of widely mocked when it, when it started, but it's become one of the most high-impact publishers in the world. And it started a secondary journal called PLOS One, which is ripping apart peer review, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, by disambiguating whether or not an article is scientifically accurate from whether or not it has impact. And PLOS One is now the largest journal publisher in the world less than four years after it launched. Just announced the publication of its 20,000th article this week, right? It's the sound of inevitability. And it's creating all of these other changes in scientific culture. So one of the first is changes in metrics. We used to measure researchers by the number of citations they got in paper journals that were held in libraries on acid-free paper. Um, now we're starting to look at that research in context and say the impact of research is on how often it gets used, right? How many times was the page viewed? How many downloads of the PDF? How many downloads of the XML? How many traditional citations from the literature? We don't want to get rid of those. The problem is that they were only ever one dimension. They just happened to be the one that we could measure. But the network doesn't just fragment the article out of the journal. It gives us the ability to look at all of the other dimensions of impact that were always there, but we just couldn't see. Comments, notes, changes, ratings, social media and all these other sorts of ways that we can communicate, suddenly we can track all of these dimensions and start to figure out what it means to have impact. Right? Changes in peer review style, I alluded to this with PLOS One, um, but it's even more interesting that Nature Publishing Group has announced a competitor to PLOS One called Scientific Reports. Right? After saying, oh, PLOS One breaking apart so you don't have, ever have a journal, you just publish the article whenever it's ready, you'll take articles on any topic, you're not going to try to decide whether they have impact or not? That's crazy. Well, you know, 20,000 articles later, um, Nature has decided this is a good business to be in. And not only are they adopting the business model through scientific reports, they're adopting open copyright licenses, which will allow you to copy and mail around those articles. They're using the Creative Commons by non-commercial license. 
So when a commercial publisher like Nature gets behind this, it's a pretty good sign that they have heard the sound of the train coming, and it's not just me up on stage being a hippie. The network also lets us change the publishable objects. When we only published paper, we had very strange restrictions, right? Paper was, in its own way, a compression algorithm that forced us to write less and less words because you could only get 600 words onto a certain number of pages, and you had to mail out the journal. And the more pages it had, the more expensive it was to mail. But now we can actually publish software. So this is a journal that I co-founded with Eric Schott and Stephen Friend called Open Network Biology. And the goal here is to actually publish data sets about human genomics and disease, as well as the software models, Bayesian models, causal models, uh, machine learning models, that turn that data into actionable knowledge. So you might have published a paper in Nature that says the following gene creates resistance to uh, methotrexate for cancer, but if you used a software model and a set of data to prove that or to provide evidence for that, you can actually have the model and the data set peer-reviewed in open network biology and get citations to it. Right? This was not possible before we had an open network. Changes the way we collaborate, too. Mendeley is a, is a company that I quite like. Um, this is sort of like a Last FM or a Pandora, but for research. It says, what papers are you reading? Right? Keep all those papers in one folder on your computer and let us see the titles of them, and then we'll recommend other papers you might like based on people who are reading papers like you. And it's become fantastically successful. And it's, again, something that becomes most valuable when it's not just the titles of the paper, but when I can actually swap the paper with you. Right? We can become friends and share our libraries with each other as opposed to constantly running into firewalls, especially if I'm a researcher in a country that doesn't have the money to pay massive bundled journal fees. Because despite all of these changes, the vast majority of scientific and scholarly publishers still try to sell you journals, not as the articles, which is the natural unit, but as bundles of journals that cost tens of thousands of dollars and tens of thousands of euros. So to get access to the one journal that is most important to you, your library has to pay tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars or euros to buy journals that nobody wants. So the technical architecture of the network is, is facilitating all of this, but there's still this resistance that's coming from the law and it's coming from the business models around the way that we publish and communicate research. Um, the, big thing, the, the other big thing that's changing is that now that we, we can also be part of this too. I am not a scientist uh, by training. I have a philosophy degree. But I actually now have the capacity to be part of the research effort as well. I, I mentioned earlier that I have a, a young son. Here's another picture of him I can't resist. He's too cute. Um, but I got myself genotyped a while back, and uh, turns out that I have a very high uh, probability of prostate cancer compared to the average human being of European descent, the average male. So the average European male has about an 18% chance of developing prostate cancer. I've got about a 32% chance genetically of developing prostate cancer. Um, and, you know, anywhere from 42 to 57 percent of the incidences of prostate cancer are related to genetics. That's why that coffee article was so interesting to me. Now, I want to be able to take my data and combine it with the data that's being generated and used in the research world at the people who use your services. But right now, the infrastructure, the architecture is set up completely against that. Copyright's a piece of it, but far more of that are the regulations on privacy, the regulations on the services you can provide to your users to share data with each other. If I give my data to somebody in the United States, it's difficult for, sh for her to share it with someone here in the Czech Republic because of privacy laws. It's difficult for her to share it with someone in Croatia because there's differences in annotation and semantics. So there's a growing ability for me to participate in the research complex, but the services that make that possible and flexible haven't emerged yet. Uh, but that's changing, too. So this is the Personal Genome Project. It's an attempt based in the United States that will soon be international. Um, it's going to have 100,000 people in it when it's done in the United States. Full sequence genomes, not just variation. Full health profiles and a line of stem cells for every person. The stem cells will be available for $70 for any purposes that anyone could want. So you'll be able to say, find me all of the Caucasian males who have the same genetic mutation that John Wilbanks has for prostate cancer, 
mail me their stem cells because I want to start testing compounds on them in my laboratory. And you'll be able to do that just as easily as ordering books off of Amazon. Right? It's happening. And the question really is, how does this integrate with the existing research complex? Does it simply replace it, or does it become part of the infrastructure? Another group I'm involved in is called Sage Bionetworks. This is a nonprofit that does massive disease modeling. The idea is if we have a certain amount of data, if we know the genes of a person, if we know what those genes are doing, if we know the clinical information about that person, we can actually build a model that predicts whether or not somebody with my mutations is going to respond positively or not to a cancer drug. Because right now, at least in the United States, when we give a cancer drug, we only have a one in four chance of that drug actually working. We have a 100% chance of toxicity, but only a one in four chance of efficacy. And so by beginning to integrate the data from people like me, totally outside the traditional research paradigm, totally outside the sorts of users that use Terrena services, we have the capacity to begin getting this sort of information out. And the question becomes again, right, is this going to integrate? Or is this going to replace? I believe it needs to integrate. right? But that's only going to happen if we can agree on a simple, open, standard, and common way to do the integration and to do the federation. Right? We've got to go back to the lessons we learned from the internet about how to th network diverse systems together. Um, but the, the reality that I want everyone to sort of go away from this part of the talk is that resisting the resistance, trying to share stuff, is a human activity. And trying to get, it out, trying to get that out of the way or trying to stop it is, is sort of a fruitless task, as the recording industry and the movie industry and the newspaper industry have been learning the hard way. And finding a way for the research industry and the education industry to work with that human activity is, is, is the most important thing that I get up to and go to work for every day. And so the, the lesson to take away, which is my last major point, is that we have to apply these principles at the content and the data layers, not just the bits and the document layers. And a digital commons is what I'm talking about. A, a commons is not some place where everything is free. It's much more like a public footpath across private land. Right? It's a place where you know you're allowed to walk, where you're allowed to make certain choices and perform certain activities. It's what we call a some rights reserved zone, which is different than all rights reserved or no rights reserved. It's not a free-for-all. There are freedoms, but there are also obligations. They're laid out in advance, and they're pre-negotiated. That's what a digital commons is. Right? And the belief is that sharing is not just a human activity, but actually drives innovation, reuse, and social benefit in research, in education, in science, in culture. So our goal at Creative Commons is to make sharing complicated things easy. And we do that by taking the lesson from the internet and building legal tools that move rights around the way that the network moves bits around, the way that the web moves documents around. They're voluntary, just like the internet's voluntary. They're standard, just like the web is standard. And they represent a user interface to copyright. The licenses form six in total, plus one, which is a public domain tool, and they create a spectrum of rights. From the top, which is the most liberal, which says you can use, make copies, distribute, download, publicly distribute, display, whatever, but you've got to give me credit. You've got to give me attribution back. And that's called the buy license. All the way down to the to one that's called buy in C and D, which says you, all you can do is make verbatim non-commercial copies. You can't make changes, and you can't make money. And there's a spectrum that's formed of these. And all you have to do to create one is go to our website and answer two questions. Do you want to allow derivative uses? Yes, no. Uh, yes, but only if others play by the same rules. And do you want to allow a commercial use? Yes or no? That's all you have to do. You don't have to call a lawyer. Um, we also provide a tool called CC0, which creates public domain status in the event that you really want things to be interoperable legally. And uh, this is a graph to the end of two, two, 2009. Um, those are numbers are in millions. Uh, we're well up into the high, uh, uh, high edge of this and sort of 800 million to a billion. It's gotten almost too hard for us to count the number of items on the web under our licenses at this point. But uh, the number of photographs at Flickr.com alone is around 200 million as of this week. And that's only counting what's been posted. Our metadata actually doesn't let us track the works that are being recreated or reused. Wikipedia is probably the most famous user 
So if you've, if you've used Wikipedia or edited Wikipedia recently, you've used a Creative Commons license. Uh, but they're in operation everywhere from the White House's website in the United States to Al Jazeera um, and beyond. They've become a standard way to give people rights to share stuff in much the same way that TCP, IP, and HTML have become standard ways to move bits through the network. And what they facilitate is the creation of these complex adaptive systems of content where you can aggregate, you can tag, you can reuse, and you can adapt without having to worry about the law creating resistance. Um, and that lets people do things like turn Wikipedia into DBpedia, which is a research attempt to turn Wikipedia into a structured semantic database of all of the assertions that are in Wikipedia. Again, now there's nothing in the architecture, either legal or technical, to prevent an unexpected reuse because we've addressed the legal resistance. And in the sciences, what people want to do is to actually take the underlying literature, all those articles that my sister might have looked at, and say most scientific articles are actually collections of facts or assertions about science. And what we want to be able to do is to remove them from the paper and publish them so that we can actually start putting them into a graph. We want to see the flow models of all of the assertions of all the papers about cancer so we can say, well, if A causes B, um, and uh, B causes D, and C is involved, somehow we'd like to be able to find those, even if they're in different papers. We don't want to have to read them and in our head assemble these models. And open copyright licenses explicitly allow the sort of transformative reuse of content to become data. Now, uh, I've spent a lot of time over the last seven years going beyond copyright stuff. So this is what our public domain dedication looks like. We really encourage um, research and education, especially in the sciences, to use CC0 to make data available in the public domain. Um, because even forcing attribution can create very long chains of attribution over the lifetime of copyright. If you were to print out Wikipedia, uh, the, there was a German Wikipedia version that was printed out and, and, and made available on Amazon. There's something like 35 pages of attribution and seven-point font at the beginning. Uh, and that only gets longer. So uh, contemplate using CC0 for things like metadata, databases, and so forth. Um, we also built what we call material transfer agreements. So the stem cells from the Personal Genome Project are available um, under this particular contract, which says basically you're allowed to do anything you want with these stem cells as long as you provide appropriate acknowledgement and you don't send them to someone else. So this, this methodology of open standard common network driven approaches to copyrights has actually now been ported to run on things like stem cells and biological materials. Um, and we've even been experimenting and researching on things like model patent licenses which are now being beta tested by companies like Nike as well as universities like the University of California at Berkeley to get their patent portfolios more broadly used, to get towards something like an eBay or an Amazon style system for patents. Um, because right now, it's another place where intellectual property isn't moving as quickly as it could. Um, all the CC licenses are implemented in the same methodology, which is I've shown you the human-readable layer, uh, but there's also, a, obviously, a lawyer-readable layer. And there's a machine-readable layer, which is that we want web services to negotiate the vast majority of these transactions. We want search engines to find things based on the rights that, that are made available. We don't want scientists and educators to have to become lawyers. We want them to be able to interface with the law in a simple way, and we want the network to manage the vast majority of the transactions based on the freedoms that somebody is, wants and the obligations they're willing to accept in exchange for them. Now, in privacy, we've just really started the research. If you want to deal with things like my genomic data, um, I probably shouldn't have shown you guys all of my genomic uh, stuff. I didn't show you all of it. Um, but if I really wanted to upload all of the data, I would have to go through some sort of process where I would say, you know what, I'm actually granting a certain set of freedoms to my data. I'm granting rights to do research, to redistribute, to publish, to commercialize. Um, but I don't want to be re-identified. I only want you to do health research. Uh, and maybe I only even want you to do disease research. Right? There's a lot of fear uh, that with the advent of new technologies, you might be able to synthesize my DNA and put it at a crime scene to frame me. So I don't want to let you do that, obviously. Um, and then I'd probably have to watch a video and go through a series of very pretentious warnings before I was actually allowed to share my data. But this is where part of the digital commons is headed. So I'm, I'm almost done. Um, and, and what I really wanted to get through in this talk was the idea that um, what you're doing in the networking world has serious implications in terms of breaking down content and, and data distribution. 
but th it's really beginning to bump up hard against the law in a way that regulates the potential of the networked world. Um, and the network that we have wasn't inevitable. It was the result of very good design choices. So from some of the original design papers of the internet, these were the three different choices that were under consideration for the internet. Uh, a centralized network, right, a distributed network, or a decentralized network, which is the one in the middle. And thankfully, the designers of the internet chose the one in the middle. They chose one where it wasn't a given that uh, one server was in the middle or that no server could have more than a couple of links. They chose one that was able to evolve and to grow. Uh, and that was simple and that was open and in the end was actually weaker than the choices of a centralized or a distributed network. And we have to make similar choices at the content and the data layer if we want this sort of innovation to continue because otherwise the law is going to continue to regulate more and more heavily. So w my sort of call to action for you is that a as you work on the next layers of the systems and the services that you provide to design for re reintegration plan for the next layer. It's going to happen at the content layer and at the data layer, and it is going to be regulated by the law. Um, there's going to be more and more data and less and less skill at using it. It's been you know, 400 or so years since Copernicus was asked to submit his tables and his writings. And we've had a lot of time as a culture to get good at dealing with written language as a medium for communicating knowledge. We haven't had that much time to get good at dealing with data. Um, and you need to build the commons into your infrastructure as a network component, not as something that is artisanal, if we really want to have this take off and win. So the, the, my closing thought, right, you know, and one more thing, is, is we really don't know how weird this is going to get yet. So I was on eBay this morning. This is how much it costs to buy a DNA sequencer on eBay on the secondary market. $455. Uh, I didn't calculate shipping costs to Prague, but I would guess that it's somewhere in the $500 range. This one doesn't have a power cord, which is why it's cheap. Um, you can get a much more modern one for about $5,000, shipped worldwide uh, within 24 hours. And that's if you want to go from physical DNA to data DNA. If you want to go the other way, from data DNA to physical DNA, you can go to mrgene.com. They will take for the cost, it's 30 cents per letter for the A, the T, the C, or the G to actually synthesize the DNA, and they will drop ship it to you uh, within seven days of ordering. Um, they have a deal going on right now because it's closing in on the end of the semester, so I think that price may drop to 25 cents US a base pair. Right, so the capacity for me to start doing my own genetic research in my garage is rapidly approaching the point where Steve Jobs built that Apple One in the late 1970s. And that's going to radically change the way that science happens. Now, when Jobs built his computer, there was an open network for him to begin connecting to. It was there, waiting, with the capacity to deal with the unexpected development. Um, there's also these things called registries of standard biological parts. So if you'd like to program bacteria using these sequencers and these synthesizing systems, you can do that. Uh, it actually started out with a group of undergraduates who programmed bacteria to be film. So this is not film, this is a gel of bacteria that were programmed using the standard biological parts to detect light and to behave in a certain way when they detected light. And they went from hello world in four years to designing systems that could actually work on global energy challenges to process oil sand. And the primary people doing this in the world are under 22. So the question is, what network are they going to find at the research layer and at the content layer when they start to actually try to push this out into the world? And if we don't build the commons in as a standardized way, right, the network that we have isn't going to react very well, well to the world that's racing right at us. Right, the cost of DNA sequencing is dropping four or five times faster than Moore's Law. And what that means is the networks that you guys provide out to your users are going to live in a world within five to 10 years that is utterly different than the world that we live in today from a research and education perspective. Textbooks are going to be basically free of charge. And there's going to be a hell of a lot of people doing science that never did science before, uh, or at least demanding to have their data be part of science. And services that incorporate that are going to be essential to actually getting the potential benefit of this that we need to have. So Creative Commons is just another layer of the network. 
And my hope is that you'll begin to build it in as a service, right, as part of the same stack that we use to connect computers, content, and, and the network together. And the, the one note I want to leave you on is that when, when you are in a world of constant change, an open system out-evolves a closed one. Because if you've got a closed network, you've got to call the vendor to change it. And you often don't have the rights to do it yourself. But if you have an open network, then you can change it whenever you need to in reaction to the world's changing. And that's one of the reasons why the internet is so powerful. That's one of the reasons why the web is so powerful. And that's one of the reasons why open access as an ethos and the commons as an implementation are so important to the next level of the network coming into being. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. That was a nice, inspiring talk. I think we have a lot of questions from the audience, and we have time to take a few. So who's going to be the first to ask? Question in front. We'll wait for the mic. Fascinating insight. Fascinating insight. Um, in your world of open data and responsibility, where does WikiLeaks live? So that's an interesting question. Um, WikiLeaks is not a wiki, of course. Um, it is simply a website that contains leaked information. Um, I, I think it illustrates um, the, the sort of natural capacity of people to use the network to share information. Um, and it illustrates the sort of inevitable impact of um, a control culture. When, when you try to stamp everything as secret, uh, but you have a global network for distributing content, all it takes is one angry uh, lower level employee in the military with a USB stick and suddenly that information is public. Uh, I, this is why making things public and shareable on purpose works so much better, in my opinion. So, you know, WikiLeaks is, I think, a fairly natural response to um, a culture of over-secrecy uh, that we live in, especially in the United States. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting. I think we'll see a um, sort of a propagation of similar sites. I don't know if you know this, the Wall Street Journal in the United States, it's a, it's a conservative publication. It's a favorite of the conservatives' party. Um, they have set up a WikiLeaks competitor, which allows you to upload your information to the Wall Street Journal so that they can publish it first. And I think you're going to see uh, more and more journalists, uh, journalism sites um, creating p capacity to upload uh, things that used to be secret so they can be published. Uh, and that's, I think, the most interesting reaction of the network to WikiLeaks I've seen is that a very conservative, staid newspaper said, you know what, this might be a way for us to make money. Uh, there was another hand, I think. Yeah, that is the one. My name is okay, um, thanks for this. Yes, yes, okay, yes wait, wait a sec, there is a gentleman there. Gentlemen there, first. Yes. Ah, okay. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I'm not completely sharing your optimism um, because um, I, I see the danger of, of misuse in, in more than one way. Uh, specifically, now that you m mentioned this bacteria research and the garage thing, uh, there was immediately the, the, the picture of some people while well, designing uh, whatever bacteria warfare things. So, what do you think about that one? Well, the, so every open system has a downside. Um, I assume everyone here gets spam in their email inbox. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the sort of commonplaceness of what's called phishing for credit card information, right? Both of these are side effects of openness in email and in the web that we wouldn't have if we had controlled systems. This is why the uh, Apple iOS is so popular is that it's a, it's a lockdown world where it's a lot harder for those sorts of abuses to happen. Um, and there's a lovely book I would recommend everyone read called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It by Jonathan Zittrain. He's a professor at Harvard Law School. 
um, which lays out, he calls these the, the inevitable side effects of what he calls generative systems. And um, I used to have my office at MIT around the corner from the Registry of Standard Biological Parts. And I can tell you that the National Security Agency came regularly to look and talk to those folks because of the fear that, um, you know, if we think a computer virus is bad, right, imagine a real virus. But um, the reality is that, the, in my opinion, that the people who are bad have the capacity to do this, whether or not there's an open culture. Right? The capacity to do this is becoming widely distributed, and it's already out into the hands of, 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 of people who would do wrong with it. I believe our capacity to respond depends on having as much knowledge floating around about how to live with the results of these systems as possible. So um, I'm pragmatic. I think that there are bad people in the world who will do bad things. But that if, uh, if only a, f a small number of companies understand these technologies, then our ability to respond rapidly is going to be a lot less than if we have that knowledge widely distributed. Uh, but I mean, it's, th there, there is no free lunch, as we say in English. And the downside of every open generative system is that it, the thing that makes it open, that makes it innovative, exposes it to abuse. And we, that's another part of what I think Terena and the Enrens and others can think about is what are the services that can be provided that emphasize the good parts of an open network and mitigate the potential for abuse. And one, one could even say simply tracking whether or not uh, a certain IP address continues to download the 1917 flu genome again and again and again might be an interesting thing to, to know. Okay, the last question, please. University of Amsterdam. I was a bit intrigued with uh, somewhere in the middle you had a movie, but you said I won't show it because that will complicate things, but you told the contents of what we were supposed to see if you would have run it. There are a few companies like Geddes and Masterfile which quietly acquired a lot of images or claim that they have the rights and copyrights to images, or maybe they really have, I don't know but are, have started recently, or in the last few years, to send out ridiculous claims to, to people by using bots to find if somebody has one of those images in his website, and then they claim uh, infringement of uh, copyright and, and demand thousands or tens of thousands of uh, dollars or euros from uh, the poor owners of those websites. So I have actually two questions. One is how can we fight or should we just ignore these kind of uh, companies or how do we deal with that? And the second thing is, we are scientists, so sometimes you want for uh, research or educational purposes to quote from these kind of media. And as far as I can read in the laws of the US uh, predominantly, but also others, uh, you can quote for ed educational or news uh, effects. So why didn't you show it claiming that uh, it was an educational thing for us. So I didn't show it because I didn't want to create technical difficulties, ah, primarily. Okay. That I know. Uh, but I'm surprised that YouTube hasn't received a takedown notice from the makers of The Matrix, right? Um, so uh, to, to the first point, um, there's a lot of people who really like to aggressively enforce copyright, a lot of content owners who really like to do that. And uh, in the world we live in, they have the right to do that. So the easiest way to avoid that is to use materials that are openly available. So uh, if you look for photographs, if you look for videos that are under Creative Commons license, then you know that you're already in a safe zone. And you can use Google Advanced Search and say, only find me items under Creative Commons licenses. And it will use the metadata associated with those objects to restrict the search to things that are open. So uh, I, I wouldn't advocate ignoring copyright claims. It, it's a way to, to lose a lot of money, uh, whether or not we think it's morally right. Legally, it's the law. Uh, but to your second point, in a, an academic or a, a research context, the vast majority of copyright laws, which vary country by country uh, to a certain extent, contain this idea of fair use. So um, you know, my belief is that by having a picture from the matrix, uh, I am not violating the copyrights of the matrix. I am making a fair use in order to prove a point. And um, fair use is um, not as strong as it should be. The uh, United Kingdom actually came out yesterday with a series of recommendations on copyright reform, which uh, recommended radically strengthening 
the sort of scope and effectiveness of fair use. There's been a series of recommendations to the World Intellectual Property Organization, again, recommend, recommending that we radically increase the scope of fair uses, exceptions, and limitations. Um, and my hope would be that educational uses um, begin to more and more fall under fair use regimes. Because the, the regime for copyright that we have was designed for media, for entertainment. And if we are not going to have major changes in the, the legislation itself, because we need to protect economically Mickey Mouse, then we definitely need to expand the number of uses that are exceptions to that rule. Uh, because, you know, I, I've talked to the guys from Disney, right? Their goal wasn't to lock up copyright on articles about cancer. You know, their goal is to protect their own portfolio, which is in the interest of their shareholders. Um, and so getting more exceptions and limitations for things like parody, satire, education, uh, and commentary, I think, is, is, is likely to be what, what happens next. But my hope is that we start to, to have a culture where people want to have stuff shared because that stuff has a higher impact and actually has a higher economic value. But that's, that's part of why I come and talk to groups like you. Uh, thank you, John. Sadly, we don't have time for further questions, but we have a gift for you. And this is a book on the history of the Internet Research Network, International Research Network. And it probably complements good with the book of Jonathan Citrin you kind of rec recommended to us. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's time to uh, close our meeting, our annual conference, and as usual, the pleasure is mine, and I'm really pleased uh, this time, and I hope this works off. Uh, as you all well know, this is the annual Terenas event, and this year, very successfully hosted by Cessnet, and uh, support was provided by Garant International, and I'd like to provide you with some of the facts and, let's say, my thoughts about the conference. First, about the statistics, yes, this is the record ever. 525 particip participants, as we counted. And when it comes to the technical facts, the facts that this conference is not only a event, face-to-face -face event, it's also becoming an event on the net. The streaming had its also uh, high points, like a maximum number of simultaneous users of close to 150 and a total over 8,000 visits from 56 countries. So this is global event, definitely. Uh, and also the wireless LAN seems to be that uh, there are more unique devices in these rooms than uh, the real persons. As you could see from these numbers, there have been 880 unique devices connected to the network via this week. And uh, actually, I'm one of the guilty ones because my uh, notebook is over there connected to the edge room and my mobile phone in the pocket is also connected to the edge room. So I'm one of the guilty ones. Um, yeah, the title was Enabling Communities. And what we had is close to 130 speakers in four plenaries and 32 sessions. And from year to year, I'm saying that this conference is also an umbrella that hosts a lot of other side meetings, workshops, both demonstrations, and from year to year I become maybe boring saying that we had a record number, but I think that you also recognize the fact that it was the record number of, of, of uh, side events, and we still have few of them after this closing event. Um, and when it comes to the event itself, um, I see the full rooms. And uh, the weather is fine, so it must be the event itself and its program that keeps you here. Uh, and that's, that's, that's very, very uh, nice to recognize. It's also a social event, I would say, so you could see from these figures that even on the social networks our, our event is getting uh, more and more popular, becoming uh, um, what people expect and, and follow up. And uh, some thoughts about the conference program itself. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a permission from the uh, keynote speaker for, for showing you this, so I feel this is okay. If you could remember, this is the talk from, this is borrowed from the talk of Andrew Cormack, who was talking about the BRICS, uh, the generosity and, and the rules. 
And um, his answer to how do you build a community is you just do it because you know it's right. And coming from the from a person who is um, involved in advising on security issues, that means uh, a little bit more than from the ordinary networker. As you know, from year to year, we now have a pleasure of one of our sponsors being able to award the students who are becoming more and more interested into our conferences. So I'd like to ask Chris Lonwick from Cisco Systems to award uh, the Best Student Poster Award. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm Chris Lonvik, uh, Director of Consulting Engineering with Cisco Systems, the Office of the CTO. Uh, this is the second year that we have uh, had a student poster contest, and it just gets better and better. Uh, let's see, we see this as an investment in this community and in ourselves. We, uh, uh, the students that we bring here have shown an interest in networking, and we hope to get them involved. So. I sincerely hope that every one of you took the time to go by and see their posters and to talk to each of these people. Um, they were great. They're, we just we had a tough time trying to find out a winner from this uh, group of people here. First, let me recognize the judges for this. Um, Lars Fisher, Fred Baker, Klaus Warenga, and Steve Wolf helped me uh, do the judging on this, and I appreciate all their uh, thoughts and insights and uh, comments on this. Um, let me, uh, can we get the lights brought up just a minute? I want to have the students stand up. Lights, there we go. Yeah. Students, uh, the 10 students who did uh, uh, enter your poster, would you stand up just for everyone to see? Yep. <laughs> And we've got, uh, yet again, I think this is going to be the last year for it, a flip video with the uh, Torino 25 logo on the thing as the prize for the what we judge to be the best poster of this. Unfortunately, uh, these babies are going to be gone pretty soon, so if you're going to get one, get one now. Uh, let's see. The, the, uh, go ahead and announce the, the poster winner for this. Uh, all of them were great, and like I said, we had a real tough time trying to come up with the final winner for this, and we looked through a lot of uh, uh, the thoughts on it. The, did the student actually do some real work on this? The answer for all of these was obviously yes. Uh, is it applicable to a real life situation? Is it going to have some, some value going forward and everything? And yeah, again, on all of these things. So uh, we finally just had to come down and say which one really represents what is going to go forward. And I'd like to thank uh, Benjamin Joaquin from HAW Hamburg for his poster on a signature-free approach to malicious code detection. Benjamin, can you come on up? Thanks to Benjamin, and thanks to everybody who did participate in this. Uh, posters are still out there, I think. If you can go see these things, if you hadn't yet, please do. And also, the rest of the students, if you could come by and see me at the posters right after this, I'd appreciate that. And also, we'll see everyone back at this next year. We plan to do it again and again, because it really does bring some value back to us and the community. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, students, again. We, Torena also welcomes student uh, presentations, and uh, please come back next year, be even better. Uh, as you know, we had another contest that was uh, related to the Torena 25th anniversary, and it was a video contest, and I'd like to invite now the president of Torena, Janne Kanner, to announce the awarded So, like you know, to celebrate the 25 years of Terena, we have held a contest of one-minute videos answering the question, how will the Internet change people's lives in the next 25 years? 
Altogether, we received 33 videos, so this was a success, from 19 countries. About one-fourth of those videos was recorded with the uh, conference gift mini recorder, which was nice. One-fourth of them were done at the Terena booth, also a bit of a miniature recording studio, and, and half with other devices. Many of the videos described how the networks and all kinds of devices connected to the internet and the clever applications on the internet will develop to make our lives easier, give us more options, more possibilities to do what we usually do in our ordinary lives. So no huge groundbreaking new ideas, but just to do what we do, what we like to do in a better, in an easier way. Another theme that was very much favored was to vision the internet all around us, invisible and always accessible without us thinking about it anymore and, and not thinking about the devices we, we use to connect to the internet, but it's just being there in a natural way. We also saw some very artistic pieces, some very nice acting, and plenty of talking heads with thought-provoking ideas. The Chutsis, Laura, Carrie and John from Terrain, a Secretariat, and myself, we emphasized the ideas with only a secondary consideration to the production values, although there were several very nice pieces with a lot of work gone to some impressive animations and soundtracks, for example. The time has now come to announce the winner. Competition was very tough, like in the poster awards as well. And it was a very close call and it took us a long time to figure out who would win the first place. For that reason, we decided to give an honorary mention to the runner-up who is winning the second place. And that is a video with several nice views about the future, some brilliant audio visuals, and a nice personal touch. It's called The Internet and My Life by Emily Jane Carrington from the NTL. Let's watch the video, please. So, like you see, this one was tough to top, but still, the winner is a video carrying a very humane message about the Internet of People, not Internet of Things, which fits nicely to Terena's mission of networking the networkers and to all that we are doing here at the conference. So, the first place and an iPad goes to a video called Internet of People by Tommy Dolenk from Arnes. I'm putting on my silly head. I won't live that one to see it. But what I'd like to see is that within 25 years we uh, begin to understand that uh, 
as we are discussing through our Facebook and tweeting, that we are social animals which basically want to build communities and to communicate. And I, I might sound like an old hippie now, which I'm not, I'm an old banker. Uh, but uh, at least I stop talking so much about internet of zillion things that will work their chips off to uh, make our life comfortable and, and safer. Uh, I don't uh, care to talk into my shoes, and nor do I want them to talk among themselves and decide which shoes should I wear depending on the weather. I need to talk to faces. All right, can you come here for a second? Uh, build me a network that will carry this message. <laughs> Congratulations, Tommy. I believe he is at the conference. Yes, please come up here to receive your prize. Could you stay for a few seconds? Okay, uh, so we've done the contest part. Uh, as usual, at the end, I'd like to do some thank yous. And to do the first one, I'd like to invite Christoph Graf, our Vice President for Technical Program. As many of you might be aware of, Janne is not continuing to be our president after this conference. And this has to do with one of his passions. It's the passions for the national research and education networking. But at one of the occasions, you showed us about some other passions you have. It was at a, a board meeting, we call it tech meeting. And... Uh, you could not attend personally because of some other passion, a nice one. And uh, then you revealed in the background of where you were, you were at home, and uh, chaired the meeting from there. It went very well. And uh, in the background, there was some instrument. And this instrument revealed some other passion of yours, the passion for the skies. And uh, as a token of appreciation, I would like to hand over this small present which directly relates to that passion on behalf of Tirina. And yesterday we learned what that actually means. Thank you for serving as a president. I really enjoyed serving the board under, under your guidance. Very clear, to the point, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, and for the program, as I said, I strongly believe that kept you uh, in the hotel venue instead of walking around this beautiful city. Uh, the guilty ones, the ones that should get their applause were the members of the program committee for this year, chaired by Lars Fischer. So please help me in thanking them for making such a good job. There are also a few more thank yous, as usual. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers and session chairs, almost 130 of them, for their effort and sharing the knowledge, strengthening our community. Especially, I'd like to thank to the plenary speakers in the order of, uh, of appearance, Yaroslav Kocha, Sezdelat, Pradip Sindhu, Jan Bird, Andrew Cormack, and last but not the least, John Wilbanks. And, of course, all, to all of you, the conference participants, you made it be a very successful event. Thank you. As usual, some people work hard 
in order to provide us with a nice event. First, I'd like to recognize our hosts, Cessnet, for doing an excellent job, especially in the technical area. I'd like now to invite Helmut Svernyak on behalf of the whole Cessnet team to accept this traditional now recognition by Terena for the hard work of our hosts. Helmut. Okay, thank you. Uh, on behalf of our director, Jan Grunterat, who very regret he uh, could uh, join this, this meeting, and of course, uh, on behalf of our Cessna team, I am very happy you accepted our invitation and uh, take part uh, of this meeting. And I am very happy, happy you enjoyed it. Thank you. I have some more presents for you. Uh, we want to ask some more people to come forward who were um, involved in this successful event. So I'd like to call now Jerzy Navratil, who was, aside of being a member of the program committee, putting an effort into a lot of stuff, demos, and uh, the organizational things. So Jerzy, please. Uh, as you have seen from the figures on one of my first slides, I rushed through. Um, the streaming and video conferencing facility was really nice, and the screens are pretty large and it looks pretty good. So now I'd like to invite the head of the team, Jan Ružička, together with all of his colleagues, and I'd like to mention their names. Ivo Hulinski, Miloš Liška, Vladimir Treštik, Peter Holub, and a student crew of Peter Nova, Kirži Marek, Nina Duhonova, and Luka Šručka. I'm sorry for pronunciation. Hope it you recognized your names. Please, guys, come forward. So I would say really thanks to my team for the excellent job, and also thanks to AV Media for a really great job providing this event. So you get a little bit of, a little token of appreciation. As a good team, you will be able to share it some way. Thank you guys again. The next team I'd like to recognize is the uh, networking team. The one who was, uh, and who still is, I think the ne wireless network still works, uh, was responsible for a record number of uh, roamers in the room, so that make that uh, Eduroam as a service really becomes a, a, a normal thing, not a, a, a dream of some people. So the team was headed by Jan Furman, so I'd like to invite Jan and his team to come forward. And the team members are Jan Neyman, Jakub Mer, Daniel Studeni, Radek Dintar, Jirji Kvarda, Jirji Raz, and Martin Czerny. Guys, please, come forward. Um, as the net work, uh, Jan is not with us, he is working. So, whoops. Thank you again. Thank you. And at the end, 
for the superb work in PR and coordination of the staff, I'd like to ask Gabriela Krčmarova to come forward and Here the gift is a little bit different. Uh, we've been for a week here in a nice uh, conference facilities of the uh, Clarion Congress Hotel in Prague. So I'd also like to thank the hotel and the catering for their work. Uh, so in respect to that, I'd like to call Lenka Holubova and Teresa Stankova to come forward. I presume you are here, yes? From, yep. from our partner who helped us in many ways, especially in organizing nice events, including the yesterday's gala event with a nice surprise at the end. I'd like to thank the Garant International and in particular Veronica Beherova, Lucy Teglova and Pavlina, Pavlina Shilarova. Could you please come forward? Well, thanks to all the members of your team. Again, thanks. Uh, as uh, another of established, uh, newly established things in the conferences, we had a student team that was doing the interviewing all across the uh, conference. And um, for that, I'd like to recognize the team from the Czech Technical University. Uh, with the members, Jerzy, Michal, Martin Draxler, Andrei Hlavac, and Jaroslav Kopecki. Could you please, guys, come forward? And uh, last but not the least, uh, from year to year, Terena Secretariat shows that they, are, they can cope with such an event. From those who are still in Amsterdam and working uh, to those who are with us for the last week. Uh, and uh, without trying to undermine anybody's contribution to the conference, I'd like to underline one, one name, and that's the John G. Horvata, and I think she deserves a big applause. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice applause. I'm very glad that it seems that you enjoy the event. And I would also like to thank personally some of my colleagues who are here with me and helping me and made all this happen and made all this smoothless and great. I was told not to speak too long, so I will be just very quick. I would like to also personally thank the Garant International staff. They've done an excellent job, very good support. Also the Clarion Congress Hotel from my side as well. The Chestnut and the AV Media team, they were extremely professional. From my experience, one of the most professional teams and also the Czech Technical University and my team members from the Terena Secretariat staff 
without whom this all wouldn't have been possible. So thank you all. Thank you very much for all of you. And uh, last thing we have to remember, this conference would not be possible without our sponsors. As you could see, a number of companies and organizations um, think that this is an interesting event and would like to support it. Thank you guys again, and I hope you will find the interest to come back and help us with the next conference. Thank you to our sponsors. Yeah, TNC 2011 is, is, is definitely finished. So let's look forward and let's look towards the next TNC. Uh, the one that will happen from 21st to 24th of May in Reykjavik, Iceland. So we are moving a little bit to the north. Uh, the conference program committee that will be in charge of making at least as good program as this one, and this is very high goal, I guarantee, will be chaired by David Kelsey, and the members are Bartosz Belter from PSNC, John Chivers from Dante, Lionel Ferret from Belgium, Bartolome Jikowski, Leif Johansson, Jerzy Navratil, Anna Hansinger, Zenon Musmulas, Brooks Schofield, Nils Van Dijk, Emil Vigufsson, and Stefan Winter. Thank you for your commitment. I hope we'll have a good program next year. And now, I'd like to invite the representative of our next hosts, Joningi, to give us a short invitation to Reykjavik. Thank you, Miroslav. Um, as you all have seen, we are... Uh, Host, trying to host the uh, next Terrana conference in, in Reykjavik uh, next year. And uh, we will, of course, hope that most of you, or hopefully all of you and all your good friends as well, will uh, be able to come there and uh, help us to make this uh, as an enjoyable occasion as this one has been, at least in my view. And we have prepared us a short video that uh, we hope that uh, you will, will like. It's not very long. Uh, if you could start the video then, please. Hi. You are not going to believe where I am now. Iceland. Yeah, it's... <laughs> it's... It's amazing, really. It's, have a look at this, yeah? <laughs> <laughs>
We are hoping to see you all uh, next year at the next TMC in 2012. And uh, it's the University of Iceland and, the, and RHNet, the Icelandic NREN, that are uh, working with Terena to, to make this uh, an enjoyable occasion for you. See you next year. Thank you. Uh, so uh, that really concludes our closing session. Uh, yeah, but, but I'm still with a note. Tell them about the feedback. Yeah, I will tell them. Please provide the feedback. We really value it, and with help of you, we make, through that feedback, we make, we think at least, we make the conference even better each and every year, although sometimes it's really hard. And also, the lunches are served for the registered participants for the events that still are going on after the lunch break. Have a safe trip home. See you next year.